It is our pleasure to have Drayton Bird, who is the doyen of, of direct marketing. Um, about four years ago, we started to talk about at Casual Connect about how uh, online games, and specifically free-to-play games, were all about direct marketing. And in that period of time, I did some research on what the best handbooks in the field would be. And I came across two books. One was by a fellow named Edward Nash called uh, Direct Marketing, but the other one was Common Sense Direct and Digital Marketing by Drayton, which, um, uh, covered, which basically showed that here is a discipline that's been around for 150 years, or in the modern form, since 1967. And in the last several years, there have been 40 reported sales of copies of people in game companies who have used it. And in fact, some of the questions that I'm going to ask Drayton later are based on their results. We then reached out to him. Uh, for those of you who are unaware, he gets paid very large amounts of money to go and lecture to people on direct marketing. And we made him an offer he could refuse, which was to, um, to come here and just speak as a courtesy to a field he hadn't spoken before, but that had gained great benefit from his work. So Drayton has been described by David Ogilvie, the, um, the, great, the all-time great advertiser, as the man who knows the most about direct marketing in the world. And I'm honored, and we, and we at Casual Connect are honored that he has come to share with us the knowledge. Drayton, do you, can, do you want to uh, complain about how we conned you to come? Uh, the man is a shit. Yeah? I mean, there's no other way to describe it. He writes to me and he says, well, I come to Amsterdam. Well, I like Amsterdam. Um, will you come and talk to this thing to do with games, you know? And I said, I know fuck all about Jack Games. Um, I said, all right, I like Amsterdam. So I said, I'll come to Amsterdam. And then I thought about it for a bit, and I thought, I really know fuck all about games, you know. So I wrote back and said, I'm not coming. And so he said, well, you don't have to do a presentation. We'll just sit and talk rubbish to each other for a, for a bit. So I thought, well, I'm good at that. Um, and that was the plan. And I woke up this morning uh, quite early, and I thought that was a bit unfair. After all, half of you are bloody starving because you haven't had anything to eat, and the other half of you are about to fall asleep because you have had something to eat. So I thought, how can I get you interested for a few minutes and possibly tell you some, something useful? Um, I saw, um, when I came into this amazing building, um, a sign up that said something along the lines of uh, connect, engage, monetize, something like that, yeah? It's a big sign from one of the sponsors, I assume. And I thought, well, that's interesting because that's really what I'm going to talk about. What I'm going to talk about is making money. But um, the first thing I thought I'd do is. Um, See if you would like to get something for nothing. Um, which, of course, is the basis upon which your industry is built. Yeah? You get something for nothing. So if you are, by any chance, interested in improving your marketing, um, if you go there, you will find out what I've learned in 56 years of trial and mostly error, working for everyone from Peppa Pig to American Express. Um, the question is, does anyone have any idea why I put that first? Anyone got a clue? Any idea why I would put that first? Well, I'll tell you why, because I'm not very bright, and so almost everything I do is based upon what I know works. And a friend of mine in Slovenia told me about four years ago that if he puts his offer up at the beginning of his talk, he gets twice as many replies. So most of the things I'm going to, in fact, everything I'm going to talk to you about in the next 20 minutes or so is about what happens if you measure things and what you should measure, and where you should spend your money if you want to make more money. Because 
a random selection of you in this room will say that probably eight out of every ten are not making lots of money, and the other two are doing pretty well, but they'd like to make more money. That's really what I'm going to talk about. But first I'll talk about toothpaste. Um, the book that I said you could get for nothing is called Scientific Advertising. It was written in 1924 by a man called Claude Hopkins who was hired as a copywriter, which is what I do, I'm a writer by trade. Uh, in 1904 he was being paid the equivalent of what today would be about uh, two and a half million dollars a year. Of course they didn't pay tax in those days. So he's doing just fine. And he, the reason he was paid all this money was that he was phenomenally good at what he did. And this is one of the products he launched. You may have heard of it. it that's an ad from 1918. He also launched other products such as Quaker puffed oats and Chevrolet cars, Schlitz beer, and so on and so on. He was legendary. And the book I'm talking about is 48 pages long. Um, you can read it in less than an hour. I've read it 20 times at the very least. Every time I read it, I learn something. My old boss, David Ogilvy, once, who wrote the foreword to the last edition of it, said that nobody should have any job in advertising unless, until they've read this book at least seven times. So that's the book, and that's the guy. And I would just like to talk to you about the principles of what you are doing and the degree to which the principles of what you are doing have not changed since 1918, and the principles of marketing have not changed since 1918. Because if you look at that ad, you'll see what Claude Hopkins is doing there is he's saying, he's talking to you about toothpaste, yeah? which hardly anybody had even heard of at that time. He, he asks you to demonstrate, in a way, at the beginning of the copy, uh, what uh, toothpaste is all about. The, the opening line says, that cloudy coat on teeth is film. At first the film is viscous, you can feel it now. So you, you, people are going, you know how you feel that film on your teeth? What he's doing is demonstrating, yeah, in words. And what you do when you're for free to play is exactly what he's done there. It is free, yeah. Here's a demonstration, yeah. And that's really the beginning of all successful marketing, particularly on the internet, yeah? Particularly on the internet. I've been doing these talks now for, since about 1977. They're all different, you'll be delighted to hear. Um, and I always used to ask people why they think they're in business. And most people, when they say they're in business, say, well, I'm in business to make money. Well, of, of course, you're in business to make money. But uh, one of the people who um, shaped, uh, one of the on that list of, of people who shaped marketing is an American professor, uh, Theodore Levitt, who said, you are in business to make and keep a customer. And what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is whether you are doing enough to keep customers as opposed to make customers. Because yeah, it's quite easy to make a customer by offering them something for nothing. Yeah? When I was thinking that I know nothing about this subject, I suddenly thought, Drayton, you're an idiot. I say this to myself fairly regularly. Um, because you actually do play a game. For 10 years, practically every day, you have played a word game. Uh, and you got it free, and then you paid to play it. And have they done anything whatsoever in those 10 years to interest you further than that? The answer is not at all. Not at all. This is interesting. Uh, when I woke up this morning and thought, God, I think I will do a presentation after all, um, I thought, we're all in the bloody gaming business, you know. And my partner, Martha, was, was in the gambling business, the online gambling business. And most marketing is gambling, so I thought we, we could play a game, if it was all right with you. So this is from the online gambling business, yeah? 
three emails tested against each other. A, B, C. Yeah? Each of those emails says exactly the same thing. The copy is identical. Yeah? The only difference is the layout. The question is, which of these three do you think would have done best? Who thinks that A would have done best? Anyone? Who thinks that B would have done best? Who thinks that C would have done best? Every time I ask this question, uh, people, the majority of people get it wrong. C did best. Nine times out of ten, if you're sending out cold solicitation in our business share, text will always be HTML because it seems more personal. Yeah? You remember I showed you you can have you can have some helpful marketing ideas? Well, this is, a, this, this is an online ad which recruits people for my helpful marketing ideas. And I do what you do, yeah? People join my list, and you see there's about 16,300 of them, yeah? And when they've been on my list for a while, I start to sell them something else, which means that, that I was with some pleasure telling uh, Eric over the weekend I made 40,000 pounds as a result of spending less than two hours writing emails to my list, yeah? And it was really, they, they, it was free to play. <laughs> You know, <laughs> they got the free ideas, and then I said, hey, how would you like something more? How would you like something more interesting? How would you like something that makes more money? Yeah. So here's a test that we ran, almost by accident. Uh, I saw that my partner had, was running ads with the lower K straight and bird 51 help marketing tips. And I said, this is grammatically incorrect, Al. Um, and he said, well, you know, do you think there would be any difference in the result between the two versions? And which one would do better, the first or the second? Who thinks that A would do better? And who thinks that B would do better? Two smart guys that got it right both times. Uh, yeah, B did better. I don't know why people do what they do. I don't care why they do. I, I think about it a lot. I think the reason why they do what they do in this particular case is that lots of people don't put caps when they send out little texts on their phones, yeah? Here's another one. I started by this, this building my list by sending out an offer, so I would like to send you 31 helpful marketing ideas, one every day for the next 31 days, would you like it? And 89 people replied, and that was the beginning of my... 16,000 whatever list, which is tiny by your standards, but makes me a living. Um, and after I'd got sent out about 12, people started writing and saying, we can't keep up with you. Can you send out them a bit more slowly? So I started sending them one out every three days. And then when I got to about 25, somebody said, you're not going to stop at 31, are you? So I kept going. And I kept going. Yeah? And we did a test. Which do you think would do better, A or B? Who thinks that 51 would beat 101? And who thinks that 101 would beat 51? 51 did better. I was really surprised. I was, it wasn't until I was speaking in Slovenia about three years ago when a guy from Bulgaria explained to me why. He said, 51 sounds like less like hard work. <laughs> Uh, this is one of my clients, uh, no longer actually, uh, 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 my, 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 my partner actually now works for them and does all their marketing. But they're quite successful in their field. If you were from England, you'd probably know their name. Uh, the man who founded it, uh, Peter Hargreaves, is worth two billion pounds, um, all through direct marketing. Um, here's a test that we did. The copy is identical. The only difference is the typeface. Who thinks that A would have beaten B? And 
Anu thinks that B would have beaten A. And then we have a vast majority who don't give a shit, as usual. Um, B beat A by between 30 and 60% in a series of tests. And I saw some research on internet readership uh, two weeks ago, which revealed that that very old typeface, which in England is called Courier, and in America can call, it's called American Typewriter in America, is one of the two most legible faces on the internet. Yeah? It's legible. I believe it works very well because it's also what I would call sincere. Yeah? You don't think that somebody who's writing to you in that typeface is going to rip you off. When I was speaking in Manila about 10 years ago, they showed me these two ads. Remember, the average ad is only seen for about two seconds before people decide to read or not. Who thinks that A would have done better than B? Who thinks that B would have done better than A? You will notice that as far as my limited ability enables me to do so, I try to tell you why things happen. Now, I'll tell you why this one was a bloody disaster. Because it, and the reason was stated in 1902 by a man called John E. Kennedy, who was the first man to define advertising really well and simply. He said, advertising is salesmanship in print. So in the book that I offered you at the beginning, the free book, the shortest chapter is called Just Salesmanship. And Claude Hopkins said, when you're looking at your copy, ask yourself what a salesman would do. So if you're selling something to lose weight, you do not greet your prospect at the door by saying, hey, fatso, yeah? Because they will say, hey, fuck off, yeah? You've got to think, what would a salesman do? Yeah? This is another of my clients, a very large company in, in the UK. Um, and here are two ads that they ran for a F, really effectively a keep fit program <laughs> with insurance thrown in. Um, that I should pay less for my health insurance was tested against this new health insurance pays off when you need it and repays you when you don't. Yeah? Who thinks that one would have done better than the second one? And who thinks the second one would have done better than that one? Okay, I'll tell you what the results were and I'll tell you why. Um, this advertising campaign was doing so badly that they fired the marketing director. We were about to close down the entire division. Um, and they called me in, because they must have been desperate, um, and said, can you help? And I wrote that ad, which actually did 10 times better than the other one. The incentive there of a free first aid kit, double response alone, yeah? Now, again, I said, I'll tell you why things happen. Yeah? Why things happen this if I just come along to you and say, I should pay less for my health insurance, there is no reason for me to read on. Yeah? It's rather like saying, I shouldn't run people over in the street. Yeah? Don't tell people that you have the purpose of every sentence, every word that you use, is to make people read the next word. Yeah? <coughs> Again, with you, when you're with a game, the purpose of each bit of that game is to get people to the next bit of the game. Yeah? It's all very similar. Everything in life is very, very similar. I'm 77, and I'm just beginning to realize this. That makes a clear promise. Yeah? This new health insurance pays off when you need it and repays you when you don't. And people say, how do I get that? And you say, instantly, up to 30% off, and so on, and so on. Yeah? Why am I so obsessed with testing? Because, as Napoleon put it, there is somebody who knows more than anybody, and that is everybody. Yeah? And this is one of the great writers of direct marketing. There are only two rules in direct marketing. Rule one, test everything. Rule two, kindly of refer to rule one. Yeah? Because you don't know. I don't know. You know. So a lot of the things I've, I quoted to you, I got wrong. You know. 
most of you got most of them wrong. Yeah? That's an interesting fact. So, you know, statistically, most of you will not make nearly as much money as you should. In 1946, the Americans sent this man to Japan to restore Japanese industry. His name was Edward Deming. He was a statistician from the US Bureau of Census. And being a statistician, he said to the Japanese, you should measure everything. And that's how things like just-in-time manufacturing happened and how Toyota came to be the biggest car manufacturer in the world and why there is a prize given in Japan every, every year called the Deming Prize. And I saw Deming speak on a video when he was even older than me, which is hard to believe. Um, and he talked about the process that is marketing, that applies to you, that applies to any business, any activity whatsoever. And I call it in my book, the one that was mentioned at the beginning, the spiral of prosperity. You have new customers, that's what you want. As you acquire new customers, you are growing data, knowledge about these customers. You are having new ways to attract these customers. You're coming up with new offers, new incentives. You're targeting better because you measure everything and you see the, the kind of people who reply and the kind of people who don't. You make more money, therefore each name is worth more so you can spend more money, yeah? And that's the process, yeah. <coughs> The question is, what's your magic number? The magic number is how much you can afford to pay to get a customer, yeah? How much can you afford to pay to get a customer? If you improve your activities consistently, year after year, month after month, each year you can pay more to get a new customer. This means you can outgun your competition at every turn, yeah? Because you, your ammunition will go further, yeah? So your objective is to make that magic number bigger. Acquire customers for less, keep them longer, and get them to spend more. Yeah? But as far as I can make out in your industry, the emphasis is on getting the customer. And there is not nearly enough done to keep the customer. Why didn't the people who make the bloody word game that I play create some system where, whereby I could do what I want to do, which is write to them and say, you assholes, there are lots of words in English that I know that you don't seem to know. Yeah? Why can't they put me in touch with other players? I get, you know, three million points, and the next nearest one gets you know, about 300. I want to know, who is this illiterate? I want to join a community, probably. Maybe, I'm not very communal, but they don't do anything. So, just now, I'm coming towards the end, you'll be relieved to know, Eric. Uh, he sits there patiently. This is what you get from for getting me to come here. <laughs> this is something from my book, it's called The Three Graces of Direct Marketing, and it tries to explain what I'm talking about. Number one, isolate individuals and put their details on a database. This is what you're doing, yeah? Number two, build a continuing relationship by using data appropriately. Number three, you build a profitable relationship by testing. Yeah? Very, very simple. Yeah? And I've talked about two of those. The toothpaste ad that I showed you at the beginning was just isolating individuals. You, you do it all the time, yeah? Build a continuing relationship. That's the interesting thing to me. Because I know a lot from studying results, and I know where my money comes from. Yeah? And my money does not come from that new customer. My money comes from keeping a customer. Yeah? The longer I can keep a customer, the more I can sell that customer. So, for instance, I, I boasted, because I'm very pleased about it, uh, that I made a lot of money over the weekend. Um, why did I make a lot of money? Because I have that list of 16,000 odd people, and at the moment they get a sequence of 156 different emails. Actually, it's about 162 because I wrote some over the weekend, yeah? Because I never ever give up in my attempt to get them to spend more money with me, yeah? And next week they're going to get something else that will, will double what I've made so far, yeah? Just by persisting, the continuing relationship. One of my clients, uh, 
is a guy called Rowan Gormley who was in business with Sir Richard Branson in Virgin Money, Virgin Finance and Virgin Wine, and he's now my client at a, a, a very interesting firm called Naked Wines. But this is something he wrote when he was at Virgin Wines. It's about building a continuing relationship. Yeah? You visited our website a while ago, but you left before buying anything. We have a hunch that you liked what you saw, but you were a little uncomfortable about buying for the first time. So here's what we suggest. And then he keeps on saying, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. You don't have anything to worry about. You don't have anything to worry about. Please reply. Yeah? He just doesn't quit. The most important thing, I guess you probably know, but if you don't, I, I noticed one of the things I saw in the limited amount of information I have about your market was that um, it, people don't really do very well with emails. Well, all I can say is, you should be doing very well with emails because I make a lot of money out of emails, yeah? And it only takes half an hour to think one up and, you know, and so on. So don't be shy. The most important thing in an email is who it comes from. The next most important thing is the subject line. This is one of the most important lessons. You can have a friend of mine called Murray Rafael went to interview this man who was the world's greatest car salesman. And he said, how come you sell so many cars, Joe? Well, let's face it, you're not in California, you're not in New York, you're not in Chicago, you're nowhere in particular, but you sell more cars than anyone else in America. And he said, well, he said, it's very simple. I realize that the next sale begins the minute I deliver the new car. If I were in your position, I'd be spending most of my time thinking about how do I get those extra sales, you know? How do I, how do I move people along, yeah? How do I move people along? towards greater profit. I paid to get them, yeah? I should make the most out of them. Yeah? This is research from McGraw-Hill from America, which was then repeated later in Sweden and Spain and came out with almost identical figures. Nobody at Ogilvy and Mather, when I used to run the uh, direct side, uh, we did a lot of research on trying to see if we could bring customers back from the dead, but we failed miserably. 5% um, uh, have friends who do deals for them. 9% go to the thing you worry about very often, which is the competition. 14% are pissed off because your product's lousy. But most people go away for that reason. Yeah? You don't talk to them enough. So take my word game. I'm playing my word game. People are weird. I'm angry. Yeah? <laughs> I'm angry because I put words in that they don't recognize or because it's been done by some maniac who's got a religious fixation. So words like orgy are not allowed, you know. You know what I mean? That's the sort of thing you want to talk to people about. You want to talk to everyone else about. So it's really making friends with your customers that matters. And there are two types of testing. I've shown you some tests. The most important one is testing in advance to see if it works. 80% of new products uh, that are launched, over 80% actually fail because pe and people don't test in advance. Yeah? They just waste a lot of money. Testing alternatives, which I've shown you. Here are some facts that relate to the thesis that I'm trying to put up in a very, very simplified way today. I know that somebody who has inquired is two to three times more likely to buy than somebody who hasn't inquired. So in your position, I'd be thinking, how close can I get to making it really, really, really easy for people to, to somehow contact me, even if they don't actually do something? Because that's next best to actually getting a trial. The people you've got, in my experience, are between three, the, the figures are generally three to eight times more likely to buy than identical people who are not customers. In my experience, in a series of tests, I found that they're four and a half times as likely to buy. This means that the people you've got are going to be much more profitable than the people you want. Yeah? So your best prospects are recent customers, frequent customers, and big spenders. These are the things that we learned at American Express and Reader's Digest and all the firms I worked for over the 50 odd years I've been in this game, and they must apply to you. And they do make the difference between profit and loss. And the other thing is, birds of a feather flock together. The customer you like is like the customer you've got. You want is like the customer you've got. Any list with a high level of similarity to yours is a good bet, and vice versa. If you have a list of people who are 87, there is a similarity of 87% on that list, you, you can't fail, you know. 
If it's lower than 15%, you cannot possibly succeed. Your best sources of business are lapsed customers. Because the reason that they tried in the first place is because they like the idea. So all you really have to do is go back and say, hey, I know you left us, but we've got this new thing. Yeah? Try us again. And of course, recommended customers, which is why viral is so important, and why I think it's terribly important in your industry to do as much as you can. And I apologize for my ignorance. I, honestly, as I said at the beginning, I know nothing about your business. Yeah? This is just things that I've noticed about every business that I've worked on. Yeah? So birds of a feather flock together. Viral really works. Yeah? This is Mae West, whose fam most famous remark was to Cary Grant in a film where she said, uh, which I think was called She Done Me Wrong. Uh, and she said to Cary Grant, is that a gun in your pocket, honey? Or are you just glad to see me? But she also said, keep a diary, honey, and one day it will keep you. And that means that's the database. The database is where the money is. That's the bank. Yeah? That is the bank. What you've got on the database, that's where your money's going to come from. Yeah? This is an example of database building. Veterans, please fill out and return the list of questions. Were you wounded during the war? If so, how and where? Do you attribute your present ill health to your war experiences? And that was to sell Dr. Williams's pink pills for pale people in 1867. 1867, yeah? They were building and using databases in 1867. Most of the people in marketing are not doing enough with their databases. I will be a bit surprised if you are. Here's an example from one of my clients years ago, Yves Rocher. People who were promised better skin care cost 50% more than those attracted by big incentives, but they were worth more over the lifetime of their relationship with the customer, 3.2 times more. Women 35 to 45 had more than double the lifetime value, the money that they spend while they're with you, than those who are younger. Married women had lifetime value 25% higher than single women, and men's average lifetime value was over four times women's. Does anyone guess why? Men who bought cosmetics were much more valuable. I've only had one person guess in anywhere I've been, and I've spoken in, I think, 56 countries. Yeah? Transvestites. The last couple of slides, you'll be relieved to know. This is uh, the greatest business writer of the 20th century, uh, Peter Drucker, who said a number of interesting things, one of which are very, very interesting. I always remember, <coughs> there is only one profit center in your business. It is the customer. He said something else. The perfect advertisement is one of which the reader can say, this is for me and for me alone. This means that in your communications, if you possibly can, you should be as personal as you conceivably can manage. I mentioned my partner, uh, Marta, who is actually a doctor of philosophy working in the investment business. And this is the response that came to one of her mailings to investors for Hargreaves Lansdowne. Dear Mr. Davis, David left me in April for an overweight transvestite called Rachel. I have no idea where he lives, so I can't pass this on. I am sorry he has messed you about as he has done to so many people. Yours sincerely. When people got the stuff that she wrote, they thought it was Alex Davis who was really sitting down and writing to them. And that's what you should aim for. Yeah? A relationship so personal that people love you and will spend more money with you. And they will. Yeah. I'm very lucky. Um, I get things from people every single day saying, I actually do get things from people saying, one woman wrote said, you write to me more than my son. I love you. And I write to people about 10 times a week, 10, 10 emails a week. And the limit is not, the question is not, are you sending out too many emails? The question is, are you sending out interesting emails and the other question is, the only people you're interested in are the people who read your emails. 
I don't care about the others, but that's by the by. So that's what you're aiming for. And just to remind you, if you found that at all interesting, um, that's all you have to do. Why did I repeat it? Because repetition works. Yeah? How to reach me? Just email db at drakenbird.com and I reply to bizarre questions from people all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Um, you actually sent me, I think, three emails one week, so I, I feel extra special now, having, <laughs> having gotten 30% of your email allotment for the week. By show of hands, how many in here are professional marketers? Okay. So Peter Drucker once said that business is marketing and innovation and everything else is just a cost. If you look at the modern game studio, um, it's business is either bringing the cost of a cons customer down, bringing the amount of money that they spend up, or uh, bringing your own cost structures down. So basically, 66% marketing. Um, and uh, marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department, as they say. Um, it's true. It, it's uh, most marketing, about, incidentally, so I have a lifetime experience with marketing directors. They're mostly completely bloody useless. And I can tell you how you can tell. There is a very, very good measurement. If you want to know how fucking useless a marketing director is, yeah? All you have to do is to see what he's called. If he's called the chief marketing officer, he's almost certainly a twat. Yeah? <laughs> you know, the, more, the bigger the title, the smaller the brain, basically, is the rule. The, same thing, the larger the company, the less the competence. Yeah? <laughs> because the people in the company, they don't care about the customers. They're thinking, I know where my money comes from. My money comes from the guy above me who's going to give me a promotion. I don't give a shit about the customers. There's a lovely line from... Uh, the guy who runs General Electric, uh, most people have their asses towards the customer and their heads towards the chairman. So marketing being so important and with so many uh, people taking on marketing responsibility without the training, I mean, you're on the list beside Tom Peters of the 50 greatest living marketers. Um, other than your own book, which we're all going to read and buy, like who do you respect and where should these people get started to enter the world of marketing? I, the, the, unquestionably, the most, um, the best marketing book is the one that is, is Claude Hopkins. There's no question. Um, the one that I give away free. Yes. The, the very short one. It's free. Wonderful thing. A, it's short. B, it's free. And C, it's the best. And it's true to say that um, everything has changed since 1924 when he wrote it. Everything except the principles. Human beings haven't changed. I think the John Caples um, tested advertising methods. J John Caples was the first man to systemata systematically test and um, act upon the results that he, he found. Um, thirdly, my old boss, David Ogilvy, uh, because he's a very good writer uh, and he covers a vast span. Um, most of the books that I uh, learn from are not uh, new books. Um, I do learn a tremendous amount from crooks. I, re I really recommend crooks. I recommend crooks. Yeah. So that anybody who goes on the internet, you all know, you regularly get messages of some lying bastard who tells you he's going to make you rich and all you've got to do is to attend this free seminar and da 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 yeah? And then you wonder where the money went, yeah? Those guys know what they're doing. As the old saying goes, the devil has all the best tunes, yeah? Study the crook, see what they're doing. Um, I was doing a talk yesterday in London and I showed, well, this is just a very short thing and I didn't, wasn't planning to say anything. Um, and I was going to show, I did show them, and I could have shown you, but it would have taken a bit too long, what I do, in fact, to make money. Because it, it's, just, I just, it's a systematic thing. Um, what people do not have uh, is a marketing process. Yeah? 
they, what they do is they go on the basis of, hey, I just had a great idea. Yeah? They do, people do not think seriously enough about what they are doing. Yeah? It, marketing, when I think that marketing pretends to be a discipline, and yet I used to go around the world and just for fun I would say to marketing audiences, how many people here can define marketing? And usually it may be three people out of a hundred, yeah? And I say, imagine if you get run over, walk out of here after this and you get run over by a tram and you're taken to the hospital and the guy, the surgeon knows fuck all about surgery, yeah? That's what happens in marketing, yeah? So those books I would certainly recommend. Um, I would recommend books. I would recommend my own book, to be honest, um, because a lot, it's been selling since 1982, and it seems to do okay. Well, I, I think you've uh, acquired more fans here, so thank you so very much for sharing with Great us. Um, we've run a little late on time, but I'm sure your adoring public can, can meet you after class to... Um, to pick your brain, and you guys have a great opportunity here in having um, Drayton available to get his brain picked, so I highly suggest uh, you take advantage of that. Thank you so much. My pleasure.